Thank you. Forgot how long that was. Sorry about that. Uh, so I'm going to discuss how a small company was able to really leverage HA Proxy to get pretty massive improvements in both performance and uh, stability for a pretty legacy platform. Um, really would help to give a little bit of background on the company. Uh, PlaceWise has been in business for over 20 years. Uh, we service the mall or shopping center industry. So, you know, if you ever go to a mall or shopping center website, that's us. We're primarily in the United States. Um, we own a pretty good chunk of the market in terms of an uh, independent vendor that isn't a real estate investment firm. Uh, and we host about 40 to 50% of all shopping center websites or supply the content for them. Um, we serve retailers and brands through our uh, online platform that's uh, called Retail Hub. And it's basically the place where anywhere from Gap and H&M to the mall operator themselves to the uh, actual local stores can load their content and have it published across anyone that has access to our system. I think one of the unique things about our environment is we act as both an agency and a platform, which adds a lot of complexity. Uh, on the agency side, we'll do like web development, ad, uh, ad creative, and, and uh, publishing. We'll manage content for clients and uh, you know, a lot of what the agency would do. On the platform side, we actually serve that up. So with, in addition to Retail Hub, we have our own custom uh, web serving platform as well as an API. So the API will feed any number of other clients, either their websites or on-screen displays, touch screens, um, and sometimes even apps. Kind of just depends on the use case. Uh, but in the grand scheme of things, we sell data, right? We are a content provider. We sell data uh, and run websites. Uh, some of the challenges. So when I joined the company six years ago, we were already in business 15 years, and we had used it was, you know, it was a pretty exciting time where you're going to get a lot of th opportunity thrown at you once you get to a certain scale in our industry. Um, but really, the, going after so many different markets was a strain on our end systems. So we went after things like grocery, and we had our own app, um, and a lot of things that were just built onto a system that really wasn't designed to scale or do anything different than uh, you know, just onesie twosie uh, updates. So what ended up happening is we had a legacy system that was incredibly single-threaded and multi-tenant. So you'd have a server that had not only one single-threaded uh, item on there, but another eight on there as well. So any one of them could take down the rest of them. And it was just kind of a cascade effect that was pretty, uh, pretty painful. Um, the, it's a Windows-based system, so it was, reboots would just take an astronomically long time, not just because the, the uh, legacy hardware were on, but also because of our caching strategy at the time. So a reboot would take over 20 minutes, which when you're in the middle of uh, troubleshooting is uh, awful. Uh, the physical hardware was already dated, so we had to do something about that. Um, and we had no disaster recovery in place. Um, we were in the process of rebuilding a platform, one we are still in process of. Anybody who has a you know, pretty massive infrastructure will know the pain of that. It's not something you can just cut off and, and put new items in there. You have to take them out one bit by bit. Uh, so we went over a little bit about my background. It's what it is, but I was bringing um, really kind of an enterprise mentality to uh, what was kind of a, a little bit of a Wild West mentality uh, at the company. Um, with that, Kate, obviously, you, you have a different set of constraints. At SunGuard, you know, we deal with budgets of millions of dollars. You know, United Healthcare doesn't really care that you spent $4 million on a data center that they're not going to use. Um, they also tend to build for scale right out of the box. You, have a new project and you're loading up you know, multi uh, instances of Oracle and 25 web servers just on the whim that it might scale. 
we also had large tech staffs, obviously. With a smaller company, you don't have that. And we'd have a pretty, at times, onerous change management process, uh, even to the, the fact that sometimes we'd have like a two-week wait just to reboot a machine, which is pretty awful. Um, but going into place-wise, you know, obviously it's a very, very small company. I had to reduce an already minimal budget. We were overpaying for a lot of the stuff that was there. We really could only build one necessary. Um, the infrastructure team right here. Um, and <laughs> change what really kind of uh, goes to the mentality of a lot of startups and things that, you know, it's just you just load this stuff up and go, right? Um, this is one of my favorite memes. I use it uh, as a bludgeon. If anybody crosses the rules, um, we have a good time with it. Uh, then now the key question that I ask and anything that I'm doing within my environment is what solution will limit or eliminate developer time, right? Because as an agency and a platform, we've got a lot of conflict there. Someone comes in and wants to pay us big bucks to develop something, a lot of times we have to answer. So I have to really kind of manage that, and both on a management side and on a solution side. Um, so I'm always looking at ways to circumvent having to have developers do the work. And what I've really come to rely on is uh, HA Proxy as a framework to program my network. So I don't look at it as a load balancer. I really look at it as a way to manage and control what's on my network. Um, between the rules that are simple to the scripting that I just hacked together, to the plugins that I've been using lately, and obviously security, um, it's been a game changer for me because now I have just a ton more control. Um, now, the first step in me getting to the, the point that we are today is, you know, something that it's pretty basic for anybody who's ever been on uh, physical hardware, you will have done this at some point or another. It was to migrate, obviously, all of our servers from legacy hardware to the cloud. Uh, there's nothing really unique on it. I think what is telling is the fact that we went from the server, physical servers, but we have eight times the amount of virtual, really shows how single-threaded and how um, constrained we were. Now, this did drive some improvements, um, but it took a year to do, even at our scale. So we didn't have the benefit of a large legal team, so we you know, have contracts that we have to just basically wait out to be able to do this. When we were in this process is when I lucked upon HA Proxy because I tried every other solution out there. Uh, you know, it's built into my firewall. I tried that. Didn't work well. You know, it's, uh, I tried a bunch of other different projects. Not great for what I needed to do. Um, I was also looking at the cloud vendors, uh, you know, load balancing solutions, but I also didn't want to get tied again to another vendor. Right? I want to be able to move data centers if I need to and take that configuration and move it somewhere else. And HPA, HA Proxy was really the best solution for me. Um, the thing that was really the kicker for me is just being able to have an agent on the local machine to circumvent some of the stuff that we needed to have done. So I'll kind of go into that uh, configuration when we get there. But the other side of this that I didn't have when I first uh, got into place was any kind of real logging. Uh, once I had HA Proxy in, in place, it was uh, extremely helpful to have a logging solution, uh, which, you know, there's, I was used to um, things like Splunk at uh, SunGuard. It was all great, but at, even at our small load, um, you know, I quickly got out of the free version. It got way too expensive quickly. So when I found Elk Stack, even though it was a, a little bit painful to put in place, it was, it was pretty much a godsend for me because I finally had both the control and now the visibility for my network. So <laughs> we had an internal joke. It became kind of like the two of them together is like a, you know, a different kind of Marvel character, right? It's the incredible Elk Stack for us. Um, so all you Marvel nerds out there, you might enjoy that one. Once we got it on there and was actually started to look at the track that they had our network, you know, it was, it was pretty eye-opening for me. Coming from a 
systems team. A lot of this stuff was already taken care of for me when I got to uh, you know, any of the systems I had to manage. So really, I was always just, how can I uh, make my servers the most performant? I didn't really was, wasn't really concerned much about security or you know, bad, uh, bad actors on the network. Uh, here was a different story. We didn't really know it was hitting us. We just had to kind of guess. Uh, when we got to logs, it was, it was pretty evident where a lot of our performance issue was coming from. You know, 60% of our traffic was pre pretty much invisible to the tools we had before I put this uh, solution in place, meaning it was all bots. You know, if I had to guess today, the, I think the legit traffic would be even lower. Um, just as a matter of course, it's just too easy to put these things in place. And uh, I don't know, there's a, some perverse... Uh, thing out there that people really want to go out and uh, see if they can get access to your servers for no real reason. Uh, roughly 12% of that was really good bots that we wanted, so search engines and uh, some monitoring. Now, we're a little bit unique in that we're fairly locally um, specific in our SEO, so we're not really as concerned about the overall uh, visibility of the sites. It's more about local search. That being said, we're still going to you know, do whatever we can to do for uh, you know, the big search engines. Um, and there's others on there that we like to whitelist, but uh, those are the big ones. But we've got that thing, and it's a, it's a balancing act, right? So we still have the performance issues that we had before. Uh, it's getting better because I'm starting to filter the bad traffic, but I still have you know, an older caching strategy that I had to deal with. Now, filtering the bot traffic, this is where I really got ingrained in, in the solutions given by the community. This was one that set me off in a pretty uh, good direction, where it was just a, a list of all of the um, bad bot strings, which was a great first step. Um, do, 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 do. And, you know, other people have done this uh, example as well. It's pretty straightforward. You know, I see that traffic come in, I put it into a stick table, and I basically just uh, bin bucket it. Um, the one thing with these is that, uh, you know, I want to time them out for about half an hour, because a lot of these bots, they will identify themselves once and then hide. You know, they'll, they'll start doing other, other kind of agent strings, and they won't necessarily show up. So if you're just, you know, blocking the agent string, you'll block one out of 300 packets. Uh, but I wanted to get them to a way that uh, I blocked them for a longer period of time, and hopefully eventually they just let me go. Uh, because the other part of that is a lot of the search engines that we didn't want, um, like Yandex and Baidu, we just don't care about them. A lot of them don't. They, they look at the robots.txt file and just ignore it. I'll see the traffic uh, coming across that they make the requests for them, but then they constantly just ignore it. So this was a good first step. I, in, in this, I already have uh, some other bad, require, uh, bad recs that I get. So people trying to do WordPress um, requests on my network, I know are already just scanners. There's, and there's a lot of those out there, right? Uh, and I just immediately just tar pit those. So once that was in place and we started to get some performance games, I wanted to really decrease the recovery time we had on our network. So I, you know, I can't change the hardware that it's on. I can't change a lot of the legacy stuff because it's pretty, pretty well hard-coded to what we had. And we still had fairly long reboot times. The, the reboot itself was quick, but the caching uh, was still pretty uh, long. So we need to warm up our servers and, you know, we had kind of hit a limit. So adding, you know, vertical, uh, any kind of vertical skating wasn't, wasn't working anymore. We'd hit a kind of a memory limit, and then it would just kind of crater anyway. Um, so I needed a different uh, solution. And this is where, you know, I started just playing with how am I going to manage the traffic on my network? How am I going to use it to, the, to things that actually help me? Search engine traffic, you know, that's just load, right? Especially Bing. And Bing is like 8% of our entire traffic load for a reason I have no idea why. 
Um, but I wanted to use it. So I started doing to my backups, and this is, this is like one pod. We have multiple pods, but this would be like an example of one pod. I wanted to start using it to my advantage. So I started taking that, uh, you know, the wanted bot traffic and now using it to warm up my backup servers. Now the effect of that was pretty significant for us. Now if we actually had a, uh, an issue on our primary and it failed over, the, it was already warmed up and ready to go. So our, you know, kind of our downtime within that uh, cutover basically went to zero. Now, since then, my team has uh, re-architected the caching, so that's no, no longer a problem. But I still do this just from system load perspective. Once I started doing that, I started looking at, well, these are uh, servers identifying themselves as Google. I did this for Bing and all the others as well. Is it actually Google? Turns out 30%, 38% of them weren't. You know, they, they're just identifying them, and it's a, just a good excuse to say, oh, I'm Google, you're just going to let me in. And uh, so I started just writing some very simple rules for that. And again, we're starting to lop off all of this illegitimate traffic. Uh, the next phase was really trying to um, cut the rest of some of the issues that I have out, out of the picture. Um, so we had already had some really big performance gains. Our cutovers were pretty much seamless. Um, but the biggest time of year for us as a shopping network is Black Friday, right? We're not doing e-commerce, but, you know, pretty much Thanksgiving afternoon in the United States, people are already starting to get uh, antsy for Black Friday, and we start hitting our spikes. So I wanted a couple things. One was a good uh, uh, recovery solution, one that would be a lot more scalable because you just don't really know in those load times what's going to hit you. Uh, we've had years in the past where we got hit by just a massive API request that kind of flat-footed us. Um, so I wanted a way to take all of the remaining single points of failure, which is, which is essentially our database, out of the picture. I also wanted to give me a better um, maintenance ability that was already kind of, uh, I had already started with some of my other failovers. So I did what, uh, you know, I was <laughs> actively blocking. I started scraping all of my sites nightly. So now I had a situation where my third level of backup was a static copy of our sites. So for the end user, it was great. You know, they, as, as far as they're concerned, the site's up and running. There was only a couple features that we're still working on for like a logged in state, which has just a couple different uh, differences. Um, but this accomplished a couple things. One is now my database took a, uh, took a complete dump. I could act as if the network was still up and no one would really know. So uh, it was really, really helpful for us in this particular instance. And with our failovers, it's, it's amazing how automated this is so that you know, when I get the alarm, I'm not immediately trying to triage uh, some issues with you know, getting people online again. I'm trying to find the root cause. It's been exceptionally helpful for us. Uh, and we had this like two weeks ago, and nobody knew it. Right? So the, the, all of the sites back up, and it's a pretty, uh, pretty scalable solution for us. As well as I have scripts available on, on the different endpoints that I can push that for our developers. So if the developers want to do something and they know they need to switch traffic, we can actually switch traffic to our static backups in, in pretty easy fashion. The last thing I had on, uh, you know, before I went to enterprise um, was really the push to be SSL everywhere. Um, we have about 2,000 SSL certs uh, for our network. So if, you, uh, if you've ever managed manually any of this SSL stuff, you would be, uh, it's just a nightmare to do. Luckily, Let's Encrypt was 
really uh, coming out of beta at the exact same time that we needed to implement it. There was no plugins, so the, the beauty of this, uh, the platform that really, really made me fall in love with it is just the ability for me to integrate this with a few bash scripts, right? And essentially one line in the config file pointing it to the directory where all these certs were. That was it. I mean, I had 2,000 SSL certs within a few days uh, up and running. Uh, and the let's, it's, a, it's, it's running today. So I know they've come out with plugins since that automatically do a lot of stuff I did. But really, it was a few lines in Bash, and we're, we're off to the races. So I had already gotten just a ton of value at this point, And we had gone from a uh, place where we were having quite a bit of outages when I had started to one where we were rock solid for a, an app that was you know, pretty long in the tooth. Um, and this is just graphic of the SSL. So at that point, I started uh, talking to uh, HA Proxy about the enterprise version. And I started to implement some of the features in there. And the first one I did, which uh, ironically, I was already in plans to create this myself with my dev team. I, I don't know why. I don't think I was reading that they actually had this in place. So uh, when I was on the phone with them, they were talking about this, and I was ecstatic because I could immediately just lop off uh, a lot of time of development to do this. It was, it, it was drop dead simple to put in place. You know, other people have, have talked about it. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. I don't, I've made a couple uh, mistakes when rolling it out where I actually put it on more people than I wanted to. And the little loading thing is not ideal. Um, so I, I have, uh, I really only put it on, on traffic that I'm pretty suspect with. Uh, but this thing is, is amazing. It changes the game for a lot of this stuff. Uh, the next thing that I integrated was GeoIP. So using this was a, was a huge help for us. Um, and I had been doing this manually with database updates for GeoIP. Uh, and being able to just put this in a few lines um, in the config was I mean, it, it was just awesome. Because then I could start using this data to uh, do a lot more traffic shaping. Uh, and it's actually coming up uh, in uh, one of our next things that we had to deal with was GDPR. But it's kind of limited for us. As our network, um, you know, our traffic is, is like 0.7% comes from the EU. Our locations are in the US and Canada, it doesn't really affect us. Although today we have one EU client, so this kind of changed. But when we put this in place, you know, we didn't have to really uh, comply to GDPR because we weren't, we weren't serving that market. But since our clients are mostly real estate investment trusts and uh, you know, mall operators, they are at a much bigger scale and their legal department did want to be compliant. So what I ended up doing was taking the static backups as the source for anything coming from the EU, and I basically stripped out all the tracking. GDPR light, done. No developers needed, and it was a very simple uh, solution for us to be able to be compliant within days. Actually, hours, but... Um, I could not get away with that here, but it was pretty good for what we had to do. And it was really because of the ability to just implement this quickly that I was able to turn that around and, again, not use any developer time. I've just been starting to play with the web application firewall. I'm about as a beginner as you can tell. Uh, but I've already seen some, some definite improvements from this. And I, I, this is my next wave of things that I'm going to investigate. Uh, because the, the shape of the traffic and the, and the threats that are hitting you is, is not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. So you need to have that layer when you're in the kind of environment that we're in to be able to handle that. So, you know, I'm kind of talking to the right crowd, right? We all know about HA proxy and how easy it is to do a lot of pretty unique and uh, 
you know, amazing things. So there's nothing there for you guys. But here's where it really hit home for us. So the reason it has helped really just change the game is our client load has doubled um, since we started this process, but our servers have not changed at all. In fact, our performance load has continually kept going down. So we have to um, architect for Black Friday uh, all the time, but that load ends up being you know, not much more than a busy day now, which is pretty much game changer for us. We had downtime when I first started in the hours per month, um, mostly unplanned, and now maybe it's minutes per month planned. Right? It's just complete 180. Uh, you know, I have a complete visibility over my network uh, and control of it. I, it really informed the way I was able to do a, a disaster recovery solution and maintenance. And to top it all off, I spend almost no time managing this. You know, the, my job is much bigger than the network, than the infrastructure. I've got all kinds of other things to do. I may spend 5% of my time on this. So the you know, investment to payoff ratio is, is pretty big. And when I look at it, the, my biggest lever is time, right? So I've bought my team time to solve problems. I may be a little bit ahead of things when I do uh, some solutions, but it's to a business problem. And I head off going to the development team. So improving performance, I was able to, to kind of mask some of the performance issues and give my team the time to fix them. And it wasn't an emergency. They could do it in the right ways. You know, GDPR and DR, I solve those without actually doing anything with the team. And I keep improving the security of our application. It's still legacy code, and I'm always just paranoid what is going to hit it, right? We've got to keep updating that. Um, but most significantly, as we build out a new platform, I bought us years, right? We didn't have to do any kind of emergency backups. We could do this in lockstep. So now we're at the time, like next year, we're going to start rolling out a completely new platform. Um, and it's on our schedule, not on someone else's. So it's, it's really because of the tools we were having within HProxy that I was able to leverage to be able to do this. Um, the one thing that, you know, was difficult for me, I can still remember what it was like to, to fire up HAProxy for the first time. Like, I had, like, no clue about what I was doing. And whenever you're doing that, you obviously have some missteps. I think one of the things, especially if they're looking at, uh, you know, some of the presenters we have today, they have these amazing solutions right? The tendency is to have to, to think that, oh, I need to, like, use those or do those now. But when you're beginning, you don't really have the ability to, to do that, especially as a small company. You know, but the benefit that I've had is I've been able to do this slowly over time. It's, it's not been one and done. I just started out with a, cu a few simple rules, figured out how it worked, and I just iterated, iterated, iterated. And uh, this is the exact platform to be able to do that. Um, these are just some other stuff for beginners, really. So with that, I'm open to any questions. Thank you.